Welcome into Locked On Phillies. In today's episode, an interesting trade deadline deal that fell through, according to some recent reports, and what it could tell us about the Phillies' plan this offseason. We'll discuss an interesting article coming up on today's Locked On Phillies. You are Locked On Phillies. Your daily Philadelphia Phillies podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, this is indeed Locked On Phillies. I am your host, Connor Thomas. I've uh, been talking Phil's baseball for years, 97.5 The Fanatic on the radio, you know, the John Kincaid Show in the morning, uh, NBC Sports Philadelphia on the TV every once in a while to check in as well, maybe your local news channel if you're out in like the Harrisburg area. I'm a busy guy, I'm a lot of places, but happily I'm here as your host of Locked On Phillies. I want to thank you for making Locked On Phillies your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcasts, and today... The first thing I want to lead off with, I was reading some Phillies news. I, I check through a couple articles every day, do some Google and look around and see what's going on in Philadelphia Phillies world so I can have the most up-to-date information for you out there listening to Locked on Phillies every day at uh, 5 p.m. when it drops. I know yesterday's episode came out a little bit sooner than that because uh, I was doing a bunch of errands a little bit later. But anyway, I digress. I caught this article, and this is by uh, Mike Rosenstein of nj.com and the title of the article is yankees pursued three-team deal with phillies mariners before trade deadline so i saw it and i was like hmm interesting i wonder how big the deal was i wonder exactly what it was this that and the other thing and i went ahead and i took a look so according to uh rosenstein's report here the yankees well they made a lot of deals at the trade deadline uh, listed here the harrison bader andrew benintendi uh, Frankie Montas and Scott Efros, all moves to bring those players in. Uh, there was one deal, though, that was apparently on the table that uh, got away from Brian Cashman, the GM up there in New York, in dealing with the Seattle Mariners. So it looks like, and this is according to the Seattle Times, which is quoted into this article on NJ.com. Keep up with all the sources. I know it's like a web of, I feel like Char uh, Charlie Kelly uh, in the episode about the mailroom. And uh, pointing at all the the strings and everything like that, trying to trying to explain why can't I remember what that guy's name was? Now I'm going to forget something Silva. I, I forget. I'll, I'll it'll come to me before the end of the episode, and I'll randomly yell it out at some point. Uh, but the quote was per multiple MLB sources and other reports, the Mariners were working on a potential trade that would have sent left-hander Marco Gonzalez to the Phillies in the days leading up to the trade deadline. Sources and rumors indicated it was a three-team deal that would have possibly sent Yankees outfielder Joey Gallo to Seattle. So it looks like Marco Gonzalez would have come to Philadelphia. Joey Gallo would have gone to Seattle. And who knows what would have gone to New York in exchange. But this is, uh, this is interesting. Now, we don't know what the Phillies were potentially offering in this and who could have moved. That would be even more interesting if we knew that. But there are some things to be learned from this and what it could mean for the Philadelphia Phillies approach this offseason. What it says to me is Noah Syndergaard was not their top option at the trade deadline. And I think we already kind of assumed that they were kicking the tires on some of the bigger name starting pitchers. And Syndergaard was the one that just fit best in the Phillies marketplace. He was a, uh, a veteran reliever. He had postseason experience. He was cheap because of the issues coming off surgery and not having his velocity and everything, the Angels not being that good of an organization. All these factors contribute into it. But Marco Gonzalez, what he finished 2022 with, he's, uh, by the way, just to tell you a little bit about him if you're not familiar, he's now a, a 30, and he would have been 30 years old. He's almost 31. But he's a 30-year-old lefty out of Fort Collins, Colorado. 4-1-3 ERA last year, 4-0-8 career ERA. Uh, he's got a total of eight years at the major league level and the past three years prior to 2022. Listen to these ERAs, 396, 310 in 2020. I know, shortened season. And then a 399 ERA in 2019. Actually, go back to even 2018, four ERA. So for the past one, two, three, four, five years, 
He's been right around the high threes, low fours as far as an ERA, besides 2020, which was the shortened season, and he had a 3-1 ERA. So that's a solid lefty veteran reliever. And I also find it very interesting that he's a lefty. Now, he's not a guy that strikes out a ton of batters. He's more of a contact guy. 183 innings this past year, only struck out 103 batters. But he's cleared 100, the 100 strikeout threshold four times in his major league career. So he can get up there, but he's just one of those guys that is a control guy. He's not going to walk too many. You're looking at probably around like 40 to 50 walks a year, which is not ideal, but not awful. You can stomach that. And the fact that he's lefty, let's go back to that because I keep bringing up that point. It says to me that the Phillies understand the weaknesses of their rotation. When you look at the top three guys in your rotation and you're looking at Zach Wheeler, you're looking at Aaron Nola, and you're looking at Ranger Suarez, well, Zach Wheeler, power, right-handed pitcher. Aaron Nola, not necessarily power, but like nasty stuff, right-handed pitcher. Ranger Suarez, lefty, a little bit younger, was kind of unproven at that point. There's going to be something interesting about the offseason here that'll tell me how much they trust Ranger Suarez. And I want to say that this potential trade deadline trade says that they'll be looking at, this is just the inkling I have. If I was a betting man, I was going to bet money on, let's say the Phillies bring in a veteran starting pitcher to fill out the four or five spot in the rotation. Smart money would be that that guy's a lefty. And it shows that they were interested in that at the trade deadline, despite already having Rangers for us in the rotation, uh, but not knowing exactly what they could expect out of him down the stretch. I think that leans that way. So if you indeed feel like they're going to add a lefty veteran, well, then it makes sense to look at left-handed pitchers who are available on the free agent market. So as I pull up left-handed pitcher free agents, uh, that will – I think narrow down the pool of potential additions for the Philadelphia Phillies in the 2022-2023 offseason. And it's hard to say definitively that it's going to be a left-handed pitcher, right? I, this is just me assuming, but I'd imagine that's the way you're going to go. Now, Kyle Gibson was recently linked to the Pittsburgh Pirates. He's Probably not going to come back. But Kyle Gibson, you're looking at a 4-8 uh, war and not a good ERA with a couple blowups. And I already talked to you about what he was this season uh, as far as uh, a slight disappointment down the stretch, but you kind of got what you traded for. I don't know who that lefty is going to be. Um, I'm really looking down these names and there's, Plenty of options that could be there. Are, what is it? Maybe like 50, 60 veteran pitchers that are out there that are available that maybe don't fit exactly into what the Philadelphia Phillies are looking to do, but a lot of, a lot of names. It's more so who they won't bring back. One, I don't think they'll bring back Kyle Gibson because even though they value lefties, they're clearly, we're looking at someone to replace him this past year. And Zach Eflin being a righty, if they bring him back, it'll be a bullpen role. I think he deserves more than that. And uh, I don't I don't think he well, obviously, he's not left handed, so he doesn't fit that mold. Yeah, I'm reading tea leaves here is what I'm trying to say. But thanks to that article uh, from NJ.com, we now have the inkling that the Phillies did indeed look to add a lefty. And I don't think Marco Gonzalez was just, uh, oh, they were just focused on Marco Gonzalez and didn't care he was left handed. I think that was a distinct opportunity for the Philadelphia Phillies to go ahead and get a veteran left-handed pitcher to kind of be this year's Kyle Gibson, right? Because Kyle Gibson in a vacuum wasn't bad for what he was brought in here to do. You trade Spencer Howard for a guy who would be here for a year or two who would give you an opportunity as a left-handed veteran. And eventually he slowed down and you ended up where you were, but you got out of Kyle Gibson what you traded for. That would have been another one of those moves. And that's kind of what the um, signing would be if they went and got a veteran starting pitcher right now. So, yeah, it leans towards Phillies looking at lefty starter. That's the news that I would break if I was breaking news, but I'm, I'm not. I'm just guessing at these things and looking at reports from the trade deadline and what it could mean to this offseason. 
So there, uh, a little fun tidbit brought out by uh, GM Brian Cashman saying a deal that was off the table, but one the Phillies were involved in and getting an idea of what Dave Dombrowski is doing. So a glimpse into what his plans were, at least at the trade deadline and possibly have carried over to this off season. Now, coming up next, we're going to get back into the uh, reviewing teams in the NL East and what they're interested in for this off season. And then we're going to go to the, uh, the basement. We're going to talk about the Washington Nationals, the last team in the division. And this is going to be, I'm going to try not to pile on because they gave us Bryce Harper and they're going to give us Trey Turner, not in a roundabout way, by letting him walk. And then he's going to be available. So if he ends up in Philly's pinstripes, we'll have to thank them a little bit. Uh, moving on from Juan Soto and Josh Bell allowed the Phillies to have easier wins down the stretch to get into a situation where they could make the playoffs and then make a run. So not going to pile on the Washington Nationals, but we'll talk about what they're looking to do this offseason and see if maybe they're looking for a splash move that could affect the Phillies' plans or if they'll indeed just be in the basement again in 2023. We'll discuss that coming up next on Locked on Phillies. Let me tell you about my friends over at Bet Online first, though, because BetOnline.net is your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, analysis, all that good stuff. Latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there are available on BetOnline.net. It's football, it's basketball, it's soccer, it's esports. They've got it all at betonline.net. You got a new Super Bowl favorite to come out of the NFC. So it's not the Philadelphia Eagles. The San Francisco 49ers are now your odds on Super Bowl appearer, I'll say, the per- team to win the NFC and go play in the Super Bowl. They jumped the Philadelphia Eagles. If you like the birds, now's a good time to get in on them to go to the Super Bowl or even win it. Check it all out. If you love sports podcasts, you can find those at Bet Online as well. They're always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting fix. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet Online is where the game starts. Okay, let's discuss the Washington Nationals' plan for their offseason and how it affects the Philadelphia Phillies. Because there's an interesting dynamic between a team that is competing for a World Series and a divisional opponent that basically is selling off all their assets and now there's a sale of the organization happening and all this crazy stuff going on down in Washington where face value you might say, what do we care about the Washington Nationals? And the fact of the matter is a lot because they're still a team in your division. Think about the NFC East for the Philadelphia Eagles. When they play, and I I guess I've just got football on the brain today, but it's it's a good comparison, right? Divisional games are huge in the NFL. They're always tight, and you're always looking at a situation where they end up mattering end of the season to determine not just who wins the division, but your seeding and everything like that. And because you play them twice, it's uber important to know your opposition. When you get in a division that's very, very bad, like the Eagles had last year, where they went 9-7 and seven and made the playoffs, well, you've got an opportunity to take advantage of some bad teams. That's... Important that you do that because those aren't opportunities, one, that every team in baseball is afforded as often as you are. It will be this year because every team plays every other team. But it's all it's also one that you can't afford to give up. Plain and simple, you have to beat the bad teams. And when one is in your division, you have to beat them consistently. So that is why it matters how much the Washington Nationals plan to be aggressive this offseason and if their aggressiveness – overlaps with the Philadelphia Phillies at all. So I'm reading this interesting article. It's from uh, Federal Baseball, which is another SB Nation. We, we talked to you about um, the, uh, the the Miami Marlins version of their SB Nation account. Well, this is the Washington Nationals one. And it's breaking down Nationals GM Mike Rizzo and what he said in various radio hits about some plans for uh, additions to the team and how to handle the offseason. Because they're a 100 lost team. That's not easy. So here's one of the first quotes from Rizzo about some of the core groups of guys that they're trying to, to look at. He said, your core group of guys that we're trying to build around is going to be Kyber Ruiz, C.J. Abrams, Luis Garcia. Then you're going to have guys like Josiah Gray, Cade Cavalli, Mackenzie Gore. So he, he listed those guys. So that's their core. And he also said the bullpen is young and controllable, so you're going to see a lot of guys back. But beyond that, we're going to go after this thing and see if we can improve ourselves for next year. So that's what you're looking at. First step, first thing I like, because we've talked multiple times how the bullpen uh, for Major League Baseball teams, well, every team heading into the offseason, you're looking at a situation where the bullpen 
is going to want to be improved upon. Well, the good news is that with the Nationals already set on bringing a lot of their young bullpen guys back, and again, the quote was, bullpen's young and controllable, so you're going to see a lot of those guys back from Nationals GM Mike Rizzo, you're looking at a situation where that's one less team that's probably going to be heavy in the bullpen market like the Philadelphia Phillies should be as they look to improve. And I'd assume the improvements to the Washington Nationals bullpen, you'd be looking at situations where it's more – uh, potentially young guys that are trying to prove themselves or cheap guys that are washed rather than actually competitive veteran arms that a championship caliber team like the Philadelphia Phillies are trying to put together. Now, that was just the initial comments on the first interview listed in this article from uh, mid-September. Then they also talked a little bit about, in October, Mike Rizzo was on the same radio station. He discussed uh, some things that they're going to do. Here's the quote that's interesting to me. We're going to attack it is the way that he described the offseason. That to me is just random nothing speak that a GM who's got his hands tied with a bad organization knows. We're going to attack it. Now we're going to go after this specific thing or we're going to have to go after that specific thing. It's all very vague. When Dave Dombrowski talked about what they're going to do, he was somewhat vague, but he said, we like the players we have here. Uh, that is a position we're interested in, though. Uh, we would like to go and look at the starting pitching market, but it's probably going to be a depth piece or whatever. Would I like to be below the luxury tax? Yeah, I would. I, I don't know, though. We went over it this past year. Rizzo is just trying to do what he can with what he's been given down there in Washington. So it's not really uh, an exciting offseason opportunity for them. There are a couple of things that they're going to to highlight. Uh, they need a couple other bats, according to this article. One or two guys that are that are bats with, like Nelson Cruz is no longer with them. Cesar Hernandez, a uh, free agent. Anibal Sanchez, Steve Sishek, uh, Erasmo Ramirez, Will Harris, Joe Ross, the other names on this list here. But Nelson Cruz is one of those bats that you're going to have to try and replace with like a veteran guy who can DH. Uh, Cesar Hernandez, you're going to need a middle infielder who's all right. But these aren't like premier guys anymore. Uh I don't know what to tell Washington Nationals fans if I was locked on Nationals. Thank goodness I have the World Series appearing and National League champion Philadelphia Phillies to talk about. But you're looking at a situation where there's a bleak look for the offseason. And all of these players that are going to be picked at by the Nationals are going to be level lower level. I don't see a star coming in. Uh, I don't see any opportunity for a big trade. They don't really have anyone prospects wise that they want to move because they're rebuilding. Uh, it's just, and they don't even know what their payroll is going to be because they're trying to figure out what's going on with ownership and the sale. And uh, I hate to pile onto the Washington nationals. I said, I wasn't going to, but I'm sorry. I think I think I might've lied. That organization's a dumpster fire. Uh, the ownership's trying to get out actively. Mike Rizzo has his hands tied at general manager. And frankly, I don't even know if he's that good to begin with. But when you have to sell off all your good players, that makes it really tough to do everything. I don't understand the plan in Washington. There's no talent level. The players they're looking at, they're not going to affect the Philadelphia Phillies. They're not going to be going for the same players. And the one place they might would be the bullpen because every team needs bullpen help. And it sounds like they're pretty set with the young guys in the bullpen. Uh, they're going to look at starting pitching, but those won't be guys that are in the market that the Phillies are looking at. Frankly, the Nationals offseason should have no effect on the Phillies and it should be abysmal and it won't be a quick bounce back from, oh, we're a hundred loss team. Next year, we're going to be right around an 80 loss team and push 500 and stuff. No, it's not going to happen for the Washington Nationals. Another bleak season for them, which means another opportunity for the Philadelphia Phillies to take advantage with, even though coming up in 2023, there will be less divisional games. Well, you're also going to have an opponent that may even be worse in the Washington Nationals than what they were in 2022, even though that would be hard to do. So that's comforting to look at that. The Marlins, big gap between them and the Phillies, like we talked about in yesterday's episode, maybe as big of a gap between the Nationals and Marlins as there is between the Marlins and Phillies. So that's even great news. So, yeah, sorry, Nationals fans, if you checked in to see what I would have to say about your offseason. Well, not a great outlook which makes it a better outlook for the Philadelphia Phillies and good news for this organization that they uh, share a division with that dumpster fire. I'll tell you who wasn't a dumpster fire in 2022. 
this next guy we're going to talk about. We're going to do a player review for one Sir Anthony Dominguez. It'll be our last one of the player review segment as we just finished up the uh, the reviews of other teams' offseason plan segment as well. So a couple recurring segments coming to an end here on today's episode, but we'll do a review of Sir Anthony Dominguez's 2022, his biggest moment of the year, and an overall grade for Dominguez as well. That coming up next as we wrap up Locked on Phillies. Okay, player review time. Sir Anthony Dominguez. 2022 season well we'll give you the numbers for the 2022 year he had 51 innings pitched 61 strikeouts those numbers are great not quite the strikeout numbers that jose alvarado had but a three era which was a little bit lower than what alvarado was at six and five win loss wise nine saves because he did have some time as closer a one one three seven whip i mean those numbers lend to what I've said about him since the playoff run started and since both him and Jose Alvarado were healthy this season and the performances they put in. They might not look the same as far as build. They might not pitch the same as far as uh, the way that they attack batters. Their stuff is similar but different, if that makes sense. They both throw hard, but Alvarado is much more of a power pitcher. Sir Anthony Dominguez is more of a true pitcher in that he doesn't just try and throw the ball by you. He has like better complementary pitches than I think Jose Alvarado has, but they're both really, really good. He's basically, though, righty Jose Alvarado with better control. Walks for nine, 3.9 for Sir Anthony Dominguez. Strikeouts for nine, 10.8. So both of those numbers a little bit lower than what you were talking about with Jose Alvarado. A little bit more contact, but that's better when – you're not putting guys on so the contact isn't costing you anything he had a really really good 2022 and this was the first year since 2018 where he was really healthy that you're looking at it believe it or not 2018 was his debut year in the uh in major league baseball with the phillies so this was only his fourth season and only his second full one since he's been a major league baseball player 28 years of age currently sir anthony dominguez so you've got another three four years of him depending on how his arm holds up and everything like that with the injury history. But your core of the bullpen is going to be built around Sir Anthony Dominguez and Jose Alvarado, hopefully for a while here. And it's a good one to build around. Sir Anthony was really, really, really good at points this year. For my money, the best reliever on this team. And that's with a guy in Jose Alvarado that I gave an A to in yesterday's player review and was one of the best lefty relievers in baseball. Nine appearances in the postseason for Sir Anthony Dominguez this year. It was great. And uh, let's look through only two earned runs in those nine appearances. So he finished the postseason with a 169 ERA in 40 batters faced. He struck out 18 of them. So he almost struck out half the batters he faced. He only walked one. He only gave up seven hits in 10 and two thirds innings pitched. So if you had, let's say it was an 11 inning extra inning game. And you had a starter go 10 and two-thirds, seven hits, two runs, two earned, 18 strikeouts with one walk, and a 169 ERA. And that that would you'd say that's exceptional. 40 batters faced. I love to build it out for relief pitchers because sometimes the numbers look weird when they're broken down by two-thirds of an inning here, one and a third innings there. But when you look at it in the entirety of what he did in the postseason two, it was really, really, really good. Uh his moment that I look at that was probably the biggest moment of the year for him, was what he did in World Series Game 1 in Houston uh, against the Houston Astros in one and two-thirds innings pitched. So that game was an interesting one because the Philadelphia Phillies win at 6-5 in Houston in extra innings in the 10th. JT Ramuto had the big home run. We know about all that. Sir Anthony Dominguez actually got the win in that game, though, believe it or not. And he was just he was huge for the Philadelphia Phillies in a big spot there. If you remember, you were looking at a situation where you had the Aaron Nola start, and then Jose Alvarado came in, Zach Eflin came in, Ranger Suarez came in. And you're kind of looking like, oh, well, Sir Anthony Dominguez is going to have to come into this game to get you to a situation where you could win it in extra innings, and he took care of business. He pitched, uh, well, you're looking at, so I'm trying to remember, so fifth and a third, six and two third. Yeah, so – eighth inning on and then David Robertson obviously closes the door on the bottom of the 10th but you had the eighth and the ninth basically were Sir Anthony Dominguez and he put you in a position to hold on and come back in that game 
So that's his biggest moment of the year. And frankly, they're twins. I got to give them the same score. I'm giving Sir Anthony Dominguez an A as well, just like I gave, gave Jose Alvarado. And I want to go back to Jose Alvarado real quick as we wrap up. Because I got a tweet saying, well, everyone else got a highlight. Why did Jose Alvarado get a low light? My point of highlighting that yesterday is that I don't think it was Jose Alvarado's fault he was put in a tough situation. So that's why I brought up what seems to be a low light for him. It was a bad thing for the Phillies. But the reason I talked about it was because I wanted to reiterate that despite him being giving up the biggest home run of the year, I don't think it was largely his fault. I look more at the decision to put him in that spot. So just covering my grounds there to say I wasn't piling on Jose Alvarado. In fact, the opposite. I was saying why I don't believe that that should be a low light for him because of the situation he was put in. But there you go. There's our season reviews for the Philadelphia Phillies players. So you can go back. I have a channel on YouTube that has our, our channel. I guess it's a playlist that lists all of them out so you can check those all out there and go back and review all of that stuff. That's it for today's Locked on Phillies. This is a fun show interesting with that article that we started with and everything like that. So coming up tomorrow, well, we're going to have stepping off since it's Wednesday. So I'll have a little uh, off the wall thing. It might be soccer related. Hmm, just think about that for a second as we prepare for tomorrow. Then any news that we get on the Philadelphia Phillies front as we still await what's been a quiet off season for them so far. I'll talk to you next time on the next Locked on Phillies, but I want to thank you real quick before I go for making Locked on Phillies your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcast. Now make your second listen Locked on Sports today. Big news happening around National Football League, uh, around the NHL, both those uh, NBA, like three sports going on right now, college basketball, college football, the college all of it on YouTube, wherever you guess. Just like this show is available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Make sure you're rating, reviewing, subscribing to everything we put together here on Locked on Phillies. I appreciate the continued support from everybody. That's all for today. I'll talk to you again tomorrow on the next Locked on Phillies.